Anyway, I'm going to move on with the agenda and I'm going to ask uh, Warinda Juss, who is um, from Thompson Solicitors, uh, to address you now. Warinda deals almost uh, totally with uh, stress issues on behalf of uh, Thompson's and he's going to set out some of the, the legal framework in which we're, we're operating with employers. So, over to you, Warinda. Thank you, Gerard. Good morning. Um, as Gerard mentioned, my name is Warren DeJust. I'm a personal injury lawyer at Thompson's. Uh, last month, on the 23rd of September, in my mind, I celebrated my 25th anniversary of being at Thompson's. Uh, and for at least 20 of those years, I have been dealing with work-related stress claims that come to us uh, at Thompson's. Um, I also coordinate the claims that come to us uh, in the Birmingham office. So. At some point or another, I would have seen every single claim that comes to us. So I can tell you that out of the many, many cases that we get where members want to claim compensation, there are only few and far between cases where we are actually successful. And we've heard this morning, I mean, the presentation this morning have actually been very good and very informative. And it goes without saying that stress is a major problem. Um, in the workplace and generally in life. Uh, the TUC conducted their own survey to coincide with the uh, World Mental Health Day and they came to the conclusion that for health and safety officials, work-related stress is now the major issue. That's the, the, the thing that they are most concerned about. And what I want to emphasize, as Gerard mentioned, I, I am going to talk to you about the legal framework, but the, the one point that I do want to emphasize right at the outset is that when the claim comes to us, and when one of your members wants to pursue a claim for compensation, things have gone wrong. That is a measure of last resort. What we need to ensure is that you don't get to that position where you need to make a claim for work-related stress. And there, the health and safety reps have a major role to play. Um, I, put, I, I wasn't aware that um, uh, you would be sitting on, on seats, with, but what I did earlier was I put a, a, Unite, a stress of work fact sheet for Unite members on, on your um, uh, table, so please have a look at that. Um, this is a, a fact sheet that we send out to the members when we get a claim, um, and if you read through that, it actually highlights briefly that the main issues and what health and safety officials, what we should try and achieve. As I say, uh, the, the first point to make is that stress should be prevented and the way you do that um, is address the problem by urging members to talk to you about what it is that is causing them stress. When the TUC did their survey, the main point that they highlighted was that workers need to actually talk. Um, and there are stigmas associated with stress, as the, the um, mind presentation uh, pointed out. Uh, but the only way that we are going to deal with the problems relating to stress is if we talk about them. If there is an issue at work, it's very likely that if a member comes to you, it's very likely that that <coughs> member isn't the only one who has a problem with stress at work. There could be a general theme running and there could be other members who are suffering. If collectively um, members are prepared to talk, then health and safety officials have the power in their role to conduct investigations, to uh, investigate the problem, to ask the employers to carry out risk assessments, um, and to represent members to deal with the issue. Um, Gerard talked about the management standards, uh, and again, that was extremely useful. Um, I, I would urge all of you to actually have a look at the management standards because it's a health and safety executive publication. It runs to some 70 pages, so it, you know, there's a lot there. Um, but one of the things that health and safety uh, officials can do is to use those management standards and take them to the employers and actually say to them that, look, this is what they should be looking at. Um, stress at work is not in the employer's interests either. Um, again, it's been mentioned that when workers are stressed, they go off work. That's not good for the employer. When they are stressed, they are not productive, they are not efficient. Um, so all of these measures can be used um, to um, actually deal with a problem in the workplace. Um, 
One of the two of the um, issues that have been brought up by the management standards, um, well, one and two, is, is the demand of, of the work, and number two, control. Um, Gerard again you know, mentioned uh, in his presentation that what's happening everywhere, I would say, in every workplace now, is because of financial difficulties, because times are hard, redundancies take place. Um, what that means is that people who are left to do the work are having to do more of the work. And, and that is something that is happening everywhere. Now legally, um, employers aren't going to interfere with that. Because what the courts say is that a manager, management has the right to manage. They're not going to interfere with business decisions. So one of the things that you can do when you have a situation like that is demands have increased, but you can look at control measures. Um, personally speaking, the one thing that causes me most stress, um, even more than having too much work when that's the case, is not being in control of the way I do my work. So that is something that you could take to the employers. If we have that situation where there is extra work because people have been made redundant, perhaps you can go to the employers and say, well look, can anything be done about how the work is controlled, how I do my work, if I can have greater say in how I do my work. Those are the kind of things that could help. Um, the other thing I would mention is that if talking to your employers doesn't help, then there is also the root of lodging a grievance. And that is something that, that I would recommend that is done if uh, talking to the employers does not actually result in uh, having a resolution to whatever the problem is. Um, if I can move on to the law now, um, and if I can explain to you how difficult it is actually to get compensation in work-related stress claims. That there are two uh, methods, if you like, as to how we would look at pursuing a claim for compensation. One is a personal injury claim, and these days we see a lot of um, cases, a lot of situations where um, employees feel that they've been bullied, they've been harassed because they've fallen out with colleagues, uh, their manager's not treating them very well, uh, and so we also look at uh, the possibility of pursuing a claim under the Protection from Harassment Act 1997. If I deal with the personal injury uh, claims element first, as we've heard, stress is a major problem. Now the law doesn't actually recognise stress as an injury. When you are pursuing a personal injury claim, you are pursuing an injury claim. What the law says is that if you are suffering from stress, if you feel angry, if you feel resentful, if you are frustrated, well that's just a, a negative emotional response. So the law will say you have not got an injury for which you can claim compensation unless you have actually had a psychiatric injury, a psychiatric disorder. And we don't want anybody to be in that position where they actually end up having a psychiatric disorder, uh, a psychiatric injury, which is why I said all of the things that I did at the beginning. So first of all, we have to establish that there has been a psychiatric disorder. Then we have to prove that that psychiatric disorder was actually caused by what it is that we are blaming the employers for. So if we are saying that I've got a psychiatric disorder because I had too much work, if the member then goes off work for some other uh, employment related problem, um, for example I had a case once where uh, it might have been a pursuable claim based on excessive work but what really actually put the uh, member off work was the fact that she didn't have a desk to sit on anymore uh, and she, she, was, she was just um, very, very concerned about somebody taking her place, then that makes it difficult to pursue a claim. So we have to be specific as to what it is that we are complaining about and then we have to link that to the cause of the psychiatric injury. So that's the second point that we have to prove. The third point that we have to prove, which is where most of the difficulties lie, is that we have to prove that the employer ought to have been able to reasonably foresee the risk of an imminent psychiatric injury. So, work-related stress is an everyday occurrence, and employers know that, but that's not enough. 
we have to actually have to be able to prove that the employer also have been able to reasonably foresee that I, if I was pursuing a claim, I was going to end up with a psychiatric disorder. And that is extremely difficult to prove, you can imagine. Um, and you may not agree with all of these rules, but that is the legal position. Um, and there has never ever been a law in this country dealing specifically with stress. You know, we've had laws dealing with other work-related problems, personal protective equipment at work, work equipment regulations that have had, workplace regulations, all of that. There has never ever been a specific um, law dealing with stress. So after having established that you've got a psychiatric injury, psychiatric disorder, and then having proven that that was actually caused by what you are complaining about, what you're saying the employers were at fault for, and then having also proven that the employer could have reasonably foreseen that, we then have to go further and say that the employer didn't take the reasonable steps it, it could have taken to prevent you from having that injury. So even you, you, when you've established all of that, if the employer says, well, actually, you know, we, we did all that we reasonably could, your claim failed. And that is why it is so difficult to pursue a personal injury claim. Another thing that I would emphasize is that, yes, you know, there are occasions, I mean, you, you know, we've had successes in work-related stress claims, um, and, and there are occasions when um, we are able to pursue a claim. But what I would emphasize is that the way that health and safety officials should be dealing with the problem is make the complaints to the employer, make the get the member to open up and then make the representations to the employer, make the complaints, send emails, keep copies of those emails. Written documentary evidence is always better than um, verbal comments made. Two things can happen if you do that. First of all, if complaints are made to the employers, if it is a situation which is quite severe, uh, where a member is really suffering, mention that, don't hold back. Two things can happen. One thing is that it could actually help in your member suffering anymore. The second thing is that that could then be evidence that we can use if we then have to pursue a claim for compensation. Because if we have evidence of complaints having been made, which were not heeded, employers not behaving reasonably, then that is evidence that we can use in pursuing a claim. The other aspect uh, I mentioned about pursuing a claim for compensation is under the Protection from Harassment Act uh, 1997. Now, again, this is um, an Act of Parliament that came into effect because there was no law against stalking, and that's the, the reason why the law came into effect. But then there was a House of Lords decision which said that you could actually, <clears throat> it's in the Act itself, but House of Lords said that you can use it in a, in a, in a workplace context. Again, with claims under uh, the Protection from Harassment Act, the courts have interpreted that act very restrictively. Um, for there to be harassment for which you can claim compensation, the conduct has to be very serious and it has to be in the order of criminal conduct. Um, the Court of Appeal uh, made a decision about six, seven years ago on, on a case where um, it actually found uh, for the claimant, but then made the comment that you could have a situation at work where the manager's behaviour or a colleague's behaviour is um, unattractive or regrettable or even unreasonable, but you would not establish harassment. To actually establish harassment, you need to cross the boundary for the conduct to be oppressive, unacceptable and in the order of criminal conduct. And we have to prove that the, the conduct, that there was a, a course of conduct which was directed uh, at the claimant. What happens is that, and there is a, a defence actually uh, that employers use very often, um, if an employer says, and then we, we get, get a lot of these cases where uh, there are uh, disciplinary proceedings, um, somebody suspended or, or they get a, a uh, a bad appraisal. Um, reasonable criticism of performance and disciplinary proceedings is often a defence that employers use and prevents us from uh, pursuing uh, a claim. Um, the one thing that, that I also need to mention to you um, 
uh, this this um, fact sheet at the front says uh, mentions prevention. Uh, there's an old adage: prevention is better than cure. Um, but when you're pursuing a, a, a claim for compensation, there is no cure as such, because even though you may think you are able to pursue a claim for compensation, the, the mere uh, exercise of pursuing a claim is extremely stressful. And that there are reasons for that. And one of the main reasons for that is that the employer will always try and say that something else is causing you stress. Uh, the mind presentation highlight that stress, depression, anxiety is very commonplace in the world in general. I mean, it's a sign of modern times, perhaps. So people suffer from depression when it might not be due to any particular cause. Um, I remember years ago when a footballer became depressed, people say, well, why are you depressed? You're earning millions of pounds. Well, the fact is he had a mental illness. He was depressed. There can be no reason for it. So the mere exercise of pursuing a claim is very stressful. What the employers will do what their solicitors will do is they will want to see your medical records and we legally cannot oppose that request because the court also wants to know whether there could be other causes of stress. Uh, one thing that always sticks in my mind, um, years ago we had a successful uh, work-related stress claim uh, which received a lot of publicity and one of my colleagues in um, our Congress House office, Tom Jones, was on the telly the following morning uh, talking about the case. And the, the phrase that he used was that um, employers will go back to the days of nappy rash to try and find out that there's something else happening in your life that was causing you stress. And it is extremely invasive. There might be things in your medical records that you don't want other people to know about. That they, and the, the mere fact is that they will say that there are other things wrong with your life. And it's extremely insulting. So it's extremely insulting to say that something else is the cause of the problems that you've had, and members do not take that well. Um, I have often tried, when I've ever pursued a claim, that's the one thing I say to them, that yes, okay, you know, we can pursue a claim, but be prepared to f suffer even more anxiety, because that is what happens. Mentally, psychiatrically, pursuing a claim isn't going to make you better, it's probably going to make you worse. Um, the other uh, issue I suppose I should mention, um, I mean I've um, uh, also attached a questionnaire uh, to the uh, uh, fact sheet and, and that's to do with the procedure that we use to um, pursue uh, stress claims or investigate stress claims. Um, one thing that I also ought to mention is time limits. Um, for a personal injury claim, there's, as you probably are aware, there's a three year time limit. For stress, it's the, the time limit starts um, on when the member first became aware or ought to have become aware that they were suffering from a condition to do with their work. And therefore, it, it's important to bear that in mind as well uh, when, you, when you are seeking legal assistance. Uh, for protection from the Harassment Act, uh, the time limit is longer, but the, the, there is no discretion. If you miss that time, there's, there's no possibility of going back to try and get the courts to exercise their discretion. For protection from harassment act claims, the time limit is six years from the date of the first act of the alleged bullying and harassment. Um, if I can move on to how we actually deal with claims when we get them. Um, as I say, and I can't emphasize this more enough, um, uh, strongly enough, strongly enough is, is, is to try and avoid the problem uh, before the member reaches a condition where they have had a psychiatric injury and you're looking to claim compensation. When we do get a claim, um, we deal with claims under the UNITE Stress Protocol. UNITE has a protocol for dealing with stress claims um, and it's, it's a, you know, a, a procedure that, that's, that, that is used by other unions as well. They have uh, their own way and protocols of dealing with claims. Um, what we do is uh, initially, uh, we send out this fact sheet. Um, we send out, there's a, a, an explanatory page about stress claims, and there's a questionnaire, and we send that out to the member. Now, this gives the member the opportunity to sit down and actually 
think about all the issues that we would be looking at in order to pursue a stress claim. So the member can uh, collect the evidence, can get hold of uh, grievance documents, hopefully working alongside his union rep as well, um, and give copies of documents uh, that would help us to make uh, an assessment as to what the merits of the claim are. When we then get the claim, uh, when we get the questionnaire, completed questionnaire back, we, we make an assessment, we uh, make a decision as to whether or not we think that there are merits for the claim. Um, and then if, which happens most of the time, if we say that there is no legal claim to be pursued because we are not going to win the claim, then we explain all of that in a letter and at the end we offer a meeting which can be face to face or by telephone. And that's the procedure that we use. If we think that the, the case has merits and it's going to be pursued, then obviously we take it further, we have a meeting and we, we discuss the, the evidence that um, we need to obtain. Um, I think I've covered all the points um, that I wanted to. Um, again, you know, if I can mention, uh, as health and safety officials, uh, you know, under the uh, Safety Representative Safety Committee's regulations, 1977, you are, you know, you're in a powerful position um, to actually make representations, carry out investigations, um, insist upon uh, risk assessments, um, and that is what I would urge uh, you to do. And the final point I would make is that we need to reach a situation where mental health is not a stigma. Uh, again, the, the, mind pre the presentation was extremely uh, useful uh, and enlightening, and the major problem that we have is the stigma uh, associated with stress. If we can get rid of that, people would be more willing to talk and problems can be addressed. Um, and I don't want to make any political comments, and I, I don't, you, know, you might have different views of Alistair Campbell, but I, I remember going to a, a Labour Party um, event where Alistair Campbell, who in his day was a very successful man, whatever you think of it, spoke openly about the depression that he had suffered, um, the alcoholism that he had suffered. Um, and what he said was actually a very good point to make, and he said that there were times, there was a time, when if somebody had cancer, there was a stigma associated to that, and people wouldn't reveal the fact that they had cancer. Fortunately, this doesn't happen any longer, because cancer is a recognized disease. People recognize that it's a, it's a serious condition. It can happen to anyone. Once we've reached that stage with stress and stress, then we can make inroads.